Hi, my name is Jennifer White, and I work for New Leaf Publishing Group and Master Books. I'm the publicist here, and today it's my honor to interview Professor Danny Faulkner. He has been writing books for Master Books for the last 20 years, at least, and we are so excited to have someone like himself who is an astrophysicist, an astrophotographer, as well as an author on um, in our list of wonderful authors who help defend the Bible with such brilliance. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm glad to have you. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about the other books that you have published with us. Well, almost 20 years ago, I published Universe by Design. It's a book on cosmology. Mm -hmm. And then I've uh, followed, that, followed that up with the new astronomy book. That's more of a, a middle schooler uh, resource for kids. But I've had a lot of adults, friends tell me that they've gotten a lot out of reading it. So it's not just a kid's book. And then I wrote... Um, uh, let's see, it was um, uh, <laughs> Expansive Heaven, which is a follow-up to uh, the Creative Cosmos. Those were uh, a pair of books uh, that were, uh, one was about biblical astronomy, what all sorts of references that the Bible makes to astronomical topics and subjects. And then the other one, The Expansive Heaven, the companion book to it was about the um, creation science of astronomy. I kind of avoided that in the biblical uh, uh, astronomy book because it was a bit much. Mm -hmm. And then uh, more recently, I, I published a book on flat earth called Falling Flat. That's a big, believe it or not, it's a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. For almost six years, I have delved into this and studied extensively. I've uh, done my research. I've gone to flat earth conventions, met many flat earthers, read many books on it. And it was my response, giving resources to people who are, are needing help on this. And right. most recently, I um, came out with um, uh, The Heavens, uh, A Different View. Yes. And it uh, really kind of comes together with some of my astrophotography and a few other things. It is a beautiful hardback book, full color. We love it. And the photos in it are amazing. I'm so excited for people to get a chance to see it and read it with their families. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about why you decided to write this book. Well, you know, I'm a professional astronomer. I uh, went to college at Bob Jones University, majoring in math, and then I uh, got a master's degree from Clemson University and a master's and then a PhD in astronomy from Indiana University. And after I finished that up, I uh, was a professor at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster, where I taught for more than a quarter century, teaching astronomy and physics and occasional little bit of math. And uh, all that time I was pursuing astronomical research. I still am active in doing that. I've been doing uh, studies on eclipsing binary stars since the late 1970s. So I still stay active in that kind of work and going to professional society meetings and such and publishing in the conventional journals. But I, my passion, of course, is to share God's creation with people and the, uh, the fact that the biblical creation is the, uh, the true origin and history of, of our universe. And um, I never really got into astro astrophotography until about six years ago. Uh, astrophotography is taking a camera and, and taking pictures of the stars and planets and galaxies and so forth. And you can do this two ways. You can take the camera lens off and mount the camera directly on with a special mount directly onto the um, telescope using the lens or mirror as the uh, as the light collector. So you get these huge uh, cameras, basically. And the other thing you can do is mount your camera with, with a normal lens on it on a tripod and take some exposure for long exposure photographs of the sky. Um, I've been doing that pretty seriously for quite some time now, and about two and a half, almost three years ago, I began doing time-lapse videos. They don't go in a book very well, but I'll take, uh, over the course of several hours, I'll take maybe hundreds or maybe a few, couple of thousand uh, images and then put them in a time-lapse, and you can see the rotation of the Earth, the stars going across the sky. You can uh, see all sorts of cool things. That's kind of a direction I've gone <clears throat> more recently. And my intent originally was to get pictures that I could use with my publications, my books, web articles we do here at Answers in Genesis related to astronomy because a lot of the really good art, uh, illustrations out there are owned by evolutionists. Okay. You either have to get permission or have to pay to get those. And I wanted to start working up a body of, of images that I could use and maybe share with other creationists. And along the way, I, I've come to know quite well two amateur astronomers who are very supportive of Answers in Genesis. And they begin sending me their pictures. And so um, after a while, they're going to say, hmm, there's an idea for a book here. 
And, you know, back about 15 years ago or more, uh, Tom Vail, who founded Canyon Ministries, uh, published with Master Books, a book called Grand Canyon, A Different View, had right. beautiful uh, images of Grand Canyon and essays uh, about the canyon from the creationary viewpoint. You know that Grand Canyon is one of those things that evolutionists like to talk about a lot, and we creationists have a different story to tell, hence mm -hmm. a different view. And then one of my colleagues here, Georgia Purdom, a biologist, she went on a week-long trip in the Galapagos Islands, and she wrote a book called the Galapagos Islands, A Different View. You know, the Galapagos Islands are taken as evidence of biological evolution. <clears throat> I got to thinking, hmm, we've got two books in the series. Why not a third book? Because the heavens, after all, are supposedly telling you about billions of years and evolutionary ideas. So in, in that vein, I wanted to write essays for this book explaining how really the heavens uh, give a different different story and a different view. And so that's the sense of um, why I put this book together. Well, we are so excited that you did. I loved reading the book and there's so much to learn. And I'm excited for you to tell us about who you wrote the book for. Who do you see reading this beautiful book? Well, you know, it's like a coffee table book with all the beautiful illustrations in it. So really it's for anybody. Uh, the essays are, are relatively short, and you can just skip those and look at the pictures if you want, like National Geographic. Few people read the articles, it seems like. and um, uh, But they they have my, my articles, my essays in, in the book uh, deal with certain aspects of uh, creation, particularly and how it relates to scripture. And I think most people will be encouraged, most Christians particularly, and uplifted. I've even thought about offering this to a few uh, non-Christian friends of mine, just as kind of a, a door opening a little bit to get yes. them to think about these things. Uh, you know, astronomy is one of those <clears throat> unique subjects that uh, I, I personally think everybody likes because of the beauty you see in yes. the pictures that you can find. The uh, Going out in night sky, if you're not moved in a totally dark sky by what you see, then there's something wrong with you, I think. And then there's the wonder how far away things are, how big they are, how small we are compared to those. I think astronomy is unique among all the sciences. And it, as I point out in the, in the early part of the, this book, uh, it kind of bridges over with the arts as well. There's something artsy about astronomy. So yes. my working, uh, working approach is that um, everybody loves astronomy at some level. And that this book is attempted to try to reach everybody at some level. Right. Well, I'm excited for you to share a few photos from within the book with our audience to let them see just how beautiful um, and wonder-filled uh, that the pages are, the full color, and then the way that you captured Do you want to hold them up for you? Yes, please. Here's one of, a, of, a, of the Andromeda Galaxy published by, mm -hmm. uh, taken by one of my amateur astronomy friends. It's going to look a lot better in the book, of course. Yes, yes. And uh, gal galaxies are amazing. They're also very faint. And mm -hmm. you need a good sized telescope in order to uh, see them very, very well. But you know, you can see your own galaxy, uh, the Milky Way. I've got a couple here that I took both of these photographs and these two pictures. Uh, one is uh, both from Arizona, the one on the um, left from Grand Canyon. I do a raft mm -hmm. trip every year through Grand Canyon. One of those terrible things they make me do here at Answers in Genesis. Uh, <laughs> that's where I met Tom Bale. And then on the right is one I took at a, at a camp in um, about 8,300 feet at uh, Grandview Camp in Eastern Arizona. So the Milky Way is one of the coolest things to look at, but you need a dark sky, a clear sky, and um, that's asking an awful lot. If you live near a city, you're never gonna see the Milky Way the way it was intended uh, to be seen. And uh, globular clusters, I, I didn't take these photographs, my amateur astronomy friends did. Uh, globular star clusters contain a few hundred, uh, bill, a few hundred thousand stars in them. Um, they're some of the most beautiful things I think to see in the sky because they are, are just uh, gorgeous. Here's a beautiful picture of the Orion Nebula. I tell people that's my second favorite thing to look at through a telescope, really? through a good size yeah. telescope. It doesn't beautiful. have this color. It looks more green to me. Mm. Um, the red, our eyes don't pick it up very well. Okay, so you so need uh, a lot of aperture. This is one of the most remarkable photos in here. Glenn Fountain, one of the two amateurs, took this one. This is the Horsehead Nebula. It too is in Orion. Now this is a faint nebula. I've only seen it once through a 24 inch telescope and it looked nothing like this. You need a long exposure to get this. And when Glenn uh, gave this to me, I, uh, I said, you took that? <laughs> and he even made a, a special print for me with a stand that I keep in my office. It's here. amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful picture. I think that may be the most remarkable photo we put in there, but there are other nebulae. 
nebulae or clouds of gas. Here's one, the Rosette Nebula. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's a beautiful photo. Again, with the eye through the telescope, you're not gonna see those colors because our, uh, our eyes just can't uh, uh, capture all that light, all that color. This is one I took, this is the uh, sun. And wow. people have a hard time seeing this. I'll bring it a little closer to the camera, but we've got some sunspots there and there's a little circle there. Yeah, that's, tell that's us about the, that. That's the Photoshop Earth. <laughs> so uh, Jim Bonser, one of the other amateur astronomers, he has Photoshop, I don't. If I need help, I send it to him. And uh, he Photoshopped, I think, that, that little Earth inside of there. And it shows you two things. First of all, how large the sun is compared to the Earth. The sun's diameter is more than 100 times out of the Earth. So the Earth is tiny, but then there are sunspots there that are larger than the Earth. I love to show people sunspots. And then when they, uh, when they uh, look at the, uh, like, look at the telescope, they'll say, oh, those little tiny spots. And I'll say, well, those little tiny spots are larger than the Earth. You're looking at them from 93 million miles away. So that 93 really million miles is so hard yeah. to comprehend. And then we have all these uh, beautiful uh, photos of the moon. I took a few myself, but most mm -hmm. of these are glim and gems. Most of these photographs are not mine. They actually are other uh, two other amateurs. By the way, sometimes I, I take my photographs, you know, astrophotos, and I get really pleased with what I get. And then I look at one of theirs and I think, well, why do I even bother? Because <laughs> they are really good in what they, what they do. Um, and then we have some of the, um, in the solar system here. Now the solar system's tricky because um, the planets are very small. And I'll just throw this up real fast. There's some pictures okay. of Jupiter here. And the one on the left over here on this side, that is not one of ours. The, um, that's actually uh, from NASA, uh, which we have a few of those in there. But the, um, the, my favorite thing to look through a telescope, I told you my second favorite, well, my favorite thing to look at through a telescope is the planet Saturn. I first saw it in September of 69. And I tell people I never got over. It. I never get tired of looking at it. Uh, we have some photographs of comets in here. Uh, one of these is mine. You'll have to get the book to find out which one it is. But uh, comets are are incredibly uh, uh, beautiful objects, and uh, they're not very commonly seen. And you need some good aperture to see them. I uh, got some meteor photos, aurora photos. We have eclipse photos. Uh, there's a uh, Particularly uh, during the solar eclipse in 2017, uh, I took this one. It shows some sunspots and the sun's partially eclipsed. Mm -hmm. And then during totality, we got some fantastic shots uh, of the sun. Uh, here are a couple here. One of, one's mine and one's somebody else's. Wow. And that's the uh, inner corona and the prominences on the edge of the sun. I have seen two uh, total solar mm -hmm. eclipses. Have you seen mm -hmm. one, Jennifer? Have you seen I don't eclipses? know that I have. Well, they, uh, you would remember, <laughs> I tell people they are the most remarkable things I have ever experienced. People say, well, it gets dark and you see this thing in the sky. Yeah, but until you actually see one, you don't get it. It's, you sit there and you have to drink everything in. It's just eerie. It's hard to describe. No photograph does, does justice to it and no uh, justice to it and no uh, uh, description does either. And there's something else that I learned at the last most recent eclipse uh, if, you, if you've seen one eclipse, you've not seen them all. You've just seen an eclipse. They're all very different. And the experience is totally different and equally wonderful. So uh, there's one coming up in 2024. I hope people will take advantage of that and, uh, and, and try, to, try to take that one in and get a little wonder, maybe a little foretaste of that from just the, the modest pictures we have. Because trust me, folks, the real deal is nothing like what the photographs show you. It's far, far better than that. So a little bit of the wonder. Uh, that I wanted to share with people. And uh, there are over 100 photographs by my count uh, we have in the book. Well, uh, I think you've done an amazing job presenting the, the heavens for us and giving us just a glimpse of God's brilliance and what he created and, and just giving us this opportunity to see how far away things are from each other and how large they are. There was one question I wanted to ask you that I thought was so interesting. How many Earths could fit inside the sun? That was in your book. Yeah, uh, normally we, I, I mentioned before that the sun's diameter is a uh, little over 100 times the Earth's diameter. Mm -hmm. But then you can look at it in terms of volume. Volume goes to the cube of the size. So uh, if you had a big sphere representing the sun and you had a little tiny balls representing the Earth, it would take well over a million Earths to fill up the inside of the sun. 
And that's, uh, you know, volumes are difficult for us to, us to comprehend, but it gives you an idea yes. of just how, how big the sun is. That's amazing. And just to think about how big the earth is to us, and yeah. then how much bigger the sun, it's beyond and my we're just imagination. just started in astronomy here. You know, the nearest star is, is incredibly far away. It's like 275,000 times the distance between the earth and the sun. And um, that's just the nearest star. And you get the, the feeling that you're pretty puny. <laughs> and to me, that's part of the, yeah. the, the awe of astronomy. If you, uh, if you begin to grasp these things, you begin to realize just how insignificant we are and how big the universe is. But you know what? It doesn't end there. Uh, the biggest universe is and as powerful as it is, it requires a bigger and more powerful creator yet. And right. that's what I like to get across to people. Let's, let's, let's get past the, 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 what, what you're seeing there and think about what this really means. Uh, I, I liken the universe to a, a, a billboard. Uh, it's advertising something to you. And yes. that advertisement is Psalm 19 telling you that the, the heavens declare God's glory. And it's echoed in Romans 1, 19 and 20, where it says men are without excuse because they look out at the heavens and they have to know that there's a creator and that is very powerful. I love that. I'm so thankful for your work and for this particular book, because it's so robust with images that draw us into the wonder of God. And I believe you've also, you've done so much work apologetically to show how creation is a viable scientific true thing. So how do you do that in this book? Is there a lot of apologetics in it? There's some, I, again, I, I try to show you what's going on here. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I talk about some of the evidences that the uh, in, a, in a low level way about the evidence is that the universe may not be as old as generally thought. I talk about the light travel time problem, which many people throw up saying, well, the, this proves that the universe is billions of years old. Uh, well, actually we have an explanation for that. And I also talk about some of the design, you know, if the universe is designed is created, then we're going to expect some design aspects there. So I have a few essays talking about those design aspects. All of these, of course, very relevant to, um, to scripture. And of course, then certain things are mentioned in scripture. The Pleiades is a star cluster. I have photographs of that in there. I have right. Orion, which is another constellation, photographs of that. It's mentioned twice in the book of Job, which is probably the oldest book in the Bible. And also, talk, uh, also talks uh, mentioned once in the book of Amos, which is one of the minor prophets, an older one, goes pretty far back. And uh, both are mentioned. They're always mentioned in conjunction because they're in the sky close to one another. And this is a time of year which you can go out and see them. I, by the way, I love Orion. It's my one of my two favorite constellations, and I love the Pleiades. I always have. Once I thought, figured out what they were when I was in high school, I thought that's a pretty cool uh, little thing in the sky. That's amazing. Well, I love learning about your love for astronomy and how you've taken that desire to glorify God and your experiences. And we just are so thankful that you are publishing books that help us give glory to God, help us see him and, and help us understand the authority of the Bible even more. I love that there's scriptures almost on every page and, and there's so much science to it. So I believe it's something that families would enjoy together as well as students of um, astronomy, students who are interested in becoming more interested, taking more courses in astronomy. I think it'll please a lot of people. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and share your expertise, share your book. We're looking forward to sharing the heavens, a different view with a lot of people. God bless you. You too.